When Moses came down from the mountain, he brought more than the Ten Commandments with him. He brought hundreds of other laws, which would become the foundation of Judaism and its traditions. Most of these are recorded in the book of Leviticus, which I confess is a rather dry and uncompromising collection of scriptures that is filled with thou shalts and, of course, thou shalt nots. Now, a lot of Christians don't really like Leviticus. They certainly wouldn't leap up to say it's their favorite book in the Bible, especially in more progressive churches. It details a series of laws that Christ supposedly fulfilled in his coming, leaving it seemingly irrelevant for people of faith in the 21st century. Leviticus, frankly, is downright off-putting to a lot of folks. When my son Levi was born, we knew we wanted to name him Levi, but we couldn't decide if it would be short for Leviathan or Leviticus. (laughs) Although I kind of preferred the latter, we went with Leviathan because, you know, it's one thing to name your son after a mythical sea monster of the Old Testament, but I was afraid that if I called him Leviticus, you all would just think I was a weirdo. (laughs) But I digress. The scripture that we're about to hear today from Leviticus 23rd chapter is still relevant for our lives today, although it may not seem that way on the surface. It's a little pedantic, to be sure, and repetitive, but sometimes repetition is a good thing when it takes the form of ritual and tradition, the very things that lend shape and order to our lives and to our world. A reading from Leviticus. These are the appointed festivals of the Lord, the holy convocations which you shall celebrate at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, there shall be a Passover offering to the Lord. And on the 15th day of the same month is the festival of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not work at your occupations. For seven days you shall present the Lord offerings by fire. On the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall not work at your occupations. And from the day after the Sabbath, from the day on which you bring the sheaf of the elevation offering, you shall count off seven weeks, they shall be complete. You shall count until the day after the seventh Sabbath, fifty days. Then you shall present an offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your settlements two loaves of bread as an elevation offering, each made of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of choice flour, baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. You shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, along with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. You shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of well-being. The priest shall raise them with the bread of the first fruits as the elevation offering before the Lord. Together with the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, you shall make proclamation. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not work at your occupations. This is a statute forever in all your settlements throughout your generations. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Y'all still awake? (laughs) Please pray with me. Everlasting and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. May they be in keeping always with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So knock-knock jokes are perhaps the least funny jokes, right? 
My second grade son loves them. He loves them so much that he brought home an entire book full of them from the school library. You see, every month, Ethan has to read at least four books for school. He usually reads them out loud to me because I have to sign off on a little paper, a piece of paper that confirms that he did the reading. And it's sort of become a part of our bedtime routine. I used to read to him. Now he reads to me. Bedtime is a a special time, one that I sometimes take for granted when I'm tired and just want to crawl into bed myself. But I love tucking my kids in and all of the little rituals that go with it, the songs, the bedtime stories, and the long, drawn-out arguments about brushing their teeth. Anyway, last week, Ethan decides that he's going to read this knock-knock joke book out loud before going to bed. So I'm lying there in his bed, and he starts firing them off at me. Knock, knock, he says. Who's there? Dwayne, he replies. Dwayne who? Dwayne the bathtub, I'm drowning. <laughs> the jokes in this book I came to learn are especially bad. Some of them don't even make sense. Knock, knock, who's there? Ohio. Ohio who? Oh, hi, nice to meet you. What happened to the, oh, it's garbage. You know, take some pride in your work. Anyway, after about a dozen of these, the repetition starts getting to me. You know, there's only so many times a man can say, who's there, before he starts losing his mind. And I ask Ethan, could maybe we please just read a story? A story would be great, but he insists on pursuing this folly. Okay, well, how many of these knock-knock jokes are left? I ask him wearily. And he stops and he flips to the back of the book, does a little math in his head as he subtracts the ones we've already read. 238, he replies. (laughs) Groaning, I roll over and bury my face in a pillow. Knock-knock, he says. I find that kids have a much higher tolerance for repetition than I do. It seems like they can watch the same TV shows, read the same books, tell the same jokes over and over again without ever getting tired of them. For my part, I'm so restless that I can scarcely finish anything the first time around. I always get impatient and move on to something else. I only watched like two seasons of Game of Thrones, if that tells you anything. And yet when I was younger, I could not only finish things, but I would enjoy them over and over again, experiencing their magic as if I were seeing it for the first time. In particular, uh, there was a movie that I must have watched over a hundred times. Now, this is a little embarrassing to admit, but when I was a freshman in high school, my brother and I literally watched it every night for a year. That film was Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 masterpiece, Bram Stoker's Dracula. I couldn't get enough of it. Keanu Reeves' fake British accent charmed me, along with his stilted delivery of awkward dialogue with lines like, I left Budapest early this morning. The impression I had was that we were leaving the West and entering the East. Now, to be clear, my brother and I never planned to do this every night. We... We just sort of fell into it. Every night, you know, each night a bit later than the last, one of us would say, maybe we should watch Bram Stoker's Dracula again. You know, we were only joking, but then we'd end up doing it for real. It became more than a routine. It was a, it was a ritual. We knew every scene, every line, and there was a familiar comfort in that. Amidst the flood of adolescent drama and the angst that the first year of high school generally brings, That film, and more importantly, the time that I spent watching it with my brother, the time that we bonded, it gave me something to cling to, something to rely on. It was a constant. No matter how bad things got at school, I knew that every day something familiar and comforting waited for me at home. The fact that it was a movie about vampires is a little sad, perhaps, and 14-year-old Seth would have gladly traded it for a girlfriend, but... But then I recall the one time I actually did have a girl over in high school. 
I, uh, I made her watch Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> On this Sunday of our church's annual meeting, I find myself thinking a great deal about the nature of ritual and repetition. The meeting is just one of our annual traditions. The church year is comprised of seasons and sacred rituals, a cycle that repeats itself year after year with only minor variations. But there's something comforting in that. And in the absence of tradition, people will go to great lengths to create their own. This text from Leviticus demonstrates precisely that. Boy, do I ever mean precisely. Here, via Moses, God establishes the rituals that are to be followed on Passover, detailing them to the letter. This so-called appointment of festivals describes when Passover begins, how long it's supposed to last, what you're supposed to eat, what you're supposed to sacrifice, right down to the recipe for the bread each made of two-tenths of an ephah, made of choice flour baked with leaven. I know the book of Leviticus reads a lot like the church bylaws, but we should ask ourselves, where do these mandates and directives really come from? Did God really descend to the peak of Mount Sinai and describe all of this in Moses while he you know, furiously took notes on a stone tablet? Did Moses even write the book of Leviticus? Some people claim that he wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, for all of you Bible scholars out there. But being as Moses dies before the fifth book ends, I think it unlikely. Now, I'll tell you what I really think is happening here. The the authors of this text understood the importance of ritual. They understood how vital it is to a community's survival and its identity. Ritual and its familiar rhythms are what hold us together in community. This is especially true of a community like the ancient Jews that lived in almost perpetual exile. Whether wandering in the wilderness for 40 years after fleeing Egypt, or living in Babylon as glorified prisoners of war, their rituals and traditions are what help them to maintain and hold on to their identity when their sons and daughters married into other cultures, when their comrades worshipped other gods, their annual festivals, Passover, Sukkot, Yom Kippur, and so on, these reminded them who they were and who their God was. These traditions kept these people from dissolving into the society around them. Tradition gives people something to cling to, a way of establishing order in lives that can otherwise feel wildly chaotic. There are other darker patterns in our world that we've grown accustomed to. Patterns of depression and addiction. Patterns of racism and sexual assault. Patterns of gun violence almost as predictable as the ticking of the clock. Our traditions offer a counterweight to those patterns, things that we can rely on to keep us grounded, and to keep us sane. Our staff uh, just had our annual calendar planning day this week. Uh, Every spring we spend about six hours together going over the next church year with a fine-tooth comb. We schedule all of our monthly church dinners and communion Sundays, our Advent and Lent services, our annual meeting, and all the other things that we've come to rely on as tradition, all the special Sundays and concerts and rituals that we look forward to. The only church ritual I don't look forward to really is the annual calendar planning day (laughs) itself. But our rituals, much like the one that we will partake in shortly, define who we are as a community. And like I said, in their absence, people will go to great lengths to create a tradition of their own. In 1966, the author Daniel O'Keefe established a family tradition that he called Festivus. Annoyed by the rampant commercialism and spiritual aspects of so many holidays, he sought something more pure, a holiday that was unburdened by historical or religious significance, 
or really any significance at all. He decided somewhat randomly to celebrate the first Festivus on the three-year anniversary of his first date with his wife, Deborah. But in subsequent years, Daniel eschewed a regular date and celebrated Festivus whenever he felt like it. The festivities included wearing funny hats, the airing of grievances with other family members, which were recorded into a tape recorder, and so-called feats of strength that involved wrestling matches on the living room floor. Daniel O'Keefe famously referred to the tradition as a festivus for the rest of us, which was apparently his way of honoring the dead who could no longer celebrate festivus with them. As you probably know, the concept was popularized by the television show Seinfeld in the 90s, portrayed as this absurd ritual that was practiced in the Costanza household. This version also included the Festivus pole, uh, a plain steel rod that's about as bland a decoration as anyone could imagine. And the episode was so popular that Festivus kind of became a real thing for a lot of people who now celebrate it on December 23rd of every year. Now, how did the idea migrate from Daniel O'Keefe's living room to network television? Well, as it turns out, Daniel O'Keefe's son, Dan Jr., worked on the show and co-wrote the Festivus episode incorporating elements of his own strange childhood. It was entirely more peculiar than on the show, the younger O'Keefe said in a New York Times interview. There was a clock in a bag, he recalled, though he never knew what it signified. If anyone ever asked the elder Daniel O'Keefe about the clock, the old man would reply, that's not for you to know. How mysterious. This bizarre assortment of rituals, the the funny hats, the airing of grievances, the feats of strength, the clock in the bag, comprised a tradition that, oddly enough, brought the O'Keefe family closer together. It seems to me that there's an awfully fine line between dull repetition and meaningful ritual. When you do something over and over and over again, what is it that makes one thing insufferable and the other thing sacred? Why am I irritated by listening to a litany of knock-knock jokes for five minutes, but I never tire of hearing the liturgy of the Lord's Supper repeated for 2,000 years? Maybe that's not for us to know. Maybe it's too mysterious. But I think therein lies the answer. It's those rituals that symbolize and articulate higher mysteries, things we can't otherwise experience or comprehend. Those are the traditions that we hold most dear. Sunday worship, baptism, Easter, communion. They keep us tethered, not only to one another, but to our God, and they never get old, no matter how many times we repeat them. I could end the sermon here, and I thought about it, but I'd like to allow myself just one more knock-knock joke. Knock, knock. Orange. Orange, you glad we're all welcome at this table? (laughs) Amen.